Welcome to week five. Uh, my name is Katie Kromick. Um, I am uh, one of the instructors for this course and uh, with you as we uh, reach the middle of the quarter um, in design thinking for social innovation. Um, today, we're going to talk about design thinking as a driver of social innovation, as well as social in a, uh, innovation ecosystems and support. So what it would look like um, as a social entrepreneur to try and reach out to a community and, and get support and, and what these different structural designs can look like. So sharing some examples of that. So as we've talked about through this course, um, I believe social innovation can show up in product design. Um, and this is again, that story from Embrace. Uh, it can show up through process design so um, the Nora Health uh, intervention of changing the process of where and when families got educated about their, their relative's health challenge. And uh, as systems design, so substantial, that um, way of changing the larger system and intervening in a particularly bad uh, scenario to help change the outcomes in the broader K-12 system. And as we talked about on the very in my first lecture, um, in order to be truly innovative, you have to get to the center of this Venn diagram. And as human centered designers, we often start with human desirability as the place that we're trying to to gain insight and drive our innovation from. Um, but ultimately, we also have to find technically feasible solutions as well as um, solutions that are viable in the marketplace. And obviously in a social entrepreneurship context, the, the whole context of our, our innovation process is around an environmental or social problem. Okay. So it is important as we start to take the kind of little seed of a solution that you developed in your design work um, and start to try and assess and understand the value that it's creating would it be viable in the marketplace, right? Is it technically feasible? So thinking about as you begin um, the second half of the quarter, and if you're pursuing this um, solution as a, as a real business opportunity to try and um, push your assumptions and, and gain information and knowledge through prototype, prototyping and testing through other research um, around uh, the value of the solution that you're offering to customers. Um, and making sure again that the idea can actually be implemented and distributed at the right cost. So is it technically feasible? Or, uh, is it financially viable? Right? Does the idea solve a real need? Is there market demand? So I'm going to talk a little bit about different um, potential uh, structural solutions and how they fit into this kind of assessing value, right? One way that um, we can create value for customers is by filling gaps in the market. Um, and again, we're going to circle back to substantial. So there was literally no large intervention, large scale support for substitute teachers at, as a profession. They were a forgotten group of people that provided a vital service. And so substantial stepped in and filled the gap by, by creating these resources and, and services for cultivating and nurturing substitute teachers. Um, sometimes the way that you create value is by creating new ways to produce or provide products or services. Um, so this example is from within the Mayo Clinic, creating a hub for innovation. So this, is, this would be an example also of an entrepreneurial effort. So you have the Mayo Clinic, you have everything that they do at such an extremely high, excellent, like level of excellence. Um, and you have this little space set aside to allow for doctors and nurses and other medical researchers and professionals to also kind of tinker at the edges and try and drive innovation um, from within this, this larger organization. Another way of creating value is discovering a new method of distribution. Um, so this is an example of uh, a company that distributes eyeglasses in the developing world. Um, and so they have created a new 
um, model where they can um, create partnerships and provide this vital service um, by uh, by creating those partnerships and creating uh, that new market for um, these uh, distrib distribution of these eyeglasses. Another way is creating these new um, new organizational structures. So an example of that is this um, Amazon, um, and what they have done is using um, data, big data and um, innovation technology tools, they're able to uh, establish a new approach to this um, solving this social problem and bringing to bear new powerful tools in this space. And then another one is finding new or underserved markets. Um, so this is an example of a project um, that is a, a kind of bringing health information to a completely underserved community in South Africa and leveraging cell phones, which many, many people have in these communities to distribute that information um, and address that health crisis. So another important question in, in this um, assessing value and understanding the market is understanding again, who are your customers? And there are different types of customers in a social entrepreneurial context. So there are the beneficiaries, there are the people who are going to benefit from your solution, but not necessarily pay for it. Um, in the case of the eyeglasses, if, if someone is funding or if the eyeglasses are being matched by someone else purchasing a pair, um, the beneficiary is receiving a pair without um, actually paying for in exchange for the goods. Um, you have customers, so you have customers who people who give you money and they get they get something in return, kind of a traditional relationship. Um, you have intermediaries, so people who purchase to donate or resell to others. Um, so you might have a company that's making you know a water filtration system, and then an in intermediary that is funding the kind of distribution of that device. And then donors, people who are paying to deliver the products and services to others. So all of these folks might be in the mix in terms of creating a viable business model for a social entrepreneurship venture. Then thinking about, you know, what is your larger strategy? So, and, and I know y'all are from, uh, or some of you who've taken other classes in this Certif certification are familiar with this business um, model canvas, but it's helpful, I think, as a strategic um, tool to just call out that once you've used your design process to come up with the solution that you feel confident in, it's important to kind of switch your mindset into implementation. And using a business model canvas can be incredibly helpful for you to think strategically about some of these larger questions about marketplace and um, business viability, et cetera. So this is an example. Um, and, in, and in this example, um, it's, it's kind of defining what these different components are and, and then creating an example based on substantial. So thinking about the product benefits and features, um, thinking about who the customer is, who the end user is, who the, you know, who the beneficiary is in this example, which might be the kids in the classroom, uh, who the intermediaries are, that might be the, the dis school district, right? Um, or if there's a foundation that's, that's funding this uh, adoption of substantial, then that might be a donor. So, so kind of modeling out again that, um, uh, what your strategy is going to be in terms of viability and feasibility. Okay, so um, the last thing I want to talk about are just these social innovation ecosystems. So there's lots and lots of support and thinking around how to, to support entrepreneurs in general, but um, there's also a lot of resources around social entrepreneurship. And if you're serious about pursuing an idea that you developed in this class or you developed in a different class, um, there are lots of resources for you to look for to get support as you're kind of venturing into this process. Um, so thinking about who, what, and why, right? Um, 
in this innovation ecosystem, you're looking for a network of supportive people engaged in social innovation. You're looking for local government officials who are interested in social entrepreneurship. You're looking for your allies and your advocates, right? You might find investors or financial, financial institutions who are going to support you. You might look to, to join an incubator or an accelerator that would give you some funding or kind of in-kind resources and also coaching and support. Um, and then what, what, what benefits might you get from this ecosystem? So thinking about infrastructure, so looking to institutions of higher education, technical expertise, co-working spaces, transportation, what are, what are the infrastructure resources that you can leverage? Um, where are there opportunities for you to network and get connected to funders and mentors? And then why? So successful entrepreneurial efforts, whether social or for-profit, require friendly and supportive conditions to succeed. They often require uh, the goodwill and the, and the generosity, generosity of people in your network or in your network's network to help kind of remove a barrier and, and help you to move forward. Um, this, of course, is a source of inequity for those who have less social capital, who have less um, access and exposure because of who they are or where they come from to these kinds of resources. And so I think looking for also um, communities that are explicitly about supporting people who are people of color, people who are working class, women in entrepreneurship. Um, there are more and more resources specifically around those inequities as well. But wanted to call out that, that, that while this is true, while it's important to be able to leverage your network and, and generosity of the people around you, um, that can also be uh, a source of inequity for others. Okay, so thinking about these organizational models for these ecosystems. Um, sometimes you might land in an ecosystem because there's a fee for service, right? So you can actually engage in this network or community through paying for it. Um, so here's an example from the, the Portland um, Art Museum as a way of kind of tapping into a community that's all invested in um, in art and art and supporting artists. You might be looking at um, an organizational model where you are um, providing a beneficial product to low income clients. So again, how might you kind of tap into the to a network and a community of organizations that are specifically working to serve um, and subsidize the exchange of goods and services for low income individuals. You might be looking at an organizational structure of subsidization and or support. So how can you again leverage the ecosystem and your network to find um, folks who are willing to uh, offset the cost of running your business model. So this is an example. Um, this company's name is D-Light and they create solar powered lanterns to reduce the burning of kerosene um, inside homes, which creates a lot of uh, pollution and health problems, but also um, now can power uh, televisions and internet routers and all kinds of things. So in this case, they um, are fundraising to subsidize the cost of the product that then they're distributing. And entrepreneurial support. So looking for people who are willing to provide funding, mentoring, consulting, and training, um, tapping into, for example, Ashoka, which we have connections to through Abby Croman and um, Portland State. Uh, which is a structure to help support social entrepreneurs. So you could apply and become a fellow, right? Or participate in their activities to get mentoring. Um, so this is another structure that can support um, your, uh, the advancement of your own organization. There's an employment model. So 
places that provide maybe job training and support to those who are underemployed. Um, so this is an ex a local example of Central City, um, which is organizational structure is to uh, provide training and pro kind of be a step in the process along the way of journey for people becoming self-sufficient. A market intermediary, so help small producers access large markets through financial or production support. So, you know, again, thinking about your ecosystem, where could, if you're making a kind of low income nutritional snack to be distributed to kids after school, how could you tap into your network and kind of piggyback on um, a company that's making high-end chocolate bars, right? Um, so thinking again about that ecosystem. So this is an example, another local example of um, actually selling, sourcing and selling uh, organic uh, natural products and being able to kind of tap into and leverage um, other manufacturers who are who are in the area. Then thinking about market linkage. So providing critical connections to markets for small producers. So again, how can we tap into this ecosystem to be able to support a small company um, through these larger kind of systemic structures? Um, so this is an example of sustainable harvest which uh, is a coffee roasting company and is able to tap into these larger networks um, of big coffee companies, but, but able to um, leverage some of that benefit to create a social good. And then a cooperative is a group of people or businesses who work together towards mutually beneficial goals. So how can you, again, kind of maybe create a coffee cooperative where everyone is working together. They're all selling their own different products. Maybe they're sourcing their beans from different places, but they're coming together and sharing infrastructure, sharing those resources. Um, so this is an example of Amicus who uh, works to install solar panels and uh, brings together all these smaller companies from all over to share again in those infrastructure pieces. Okay, so we are at the middle of the quarter and your um, kind of tasks for this week are to both continue to engage online and in your peer mentor discussions and to review your design frameworks, um, make changes, additions, you know, uh, where there are, th there are thin spots, kind of build it out and make it more rigorous and robust. Um, and then you'll turn in essentially your mural link to me and I will review your design work um, as, as I evaluate your midterm. So as always, if you have any questions or concerns, um, please feel free to email me or reach out to connect during office hours or at another time if that doesn't work for you. Um, and it's been a pleasure uh, working with you these past weeks and I will continue to be available for office hours and we'll continue to review your work and work with Todd as he takes over lectures and things like that. But um, thank you all.